Greetings and welcome to the University of Minnesota Alumni Association's webinar series. My name is John Ruzek and I'm the Senior Director of Alumni Networks here at the U. Thanks to all the alumni and friends who have made time to join us live today on this wonderful Thursday. I imagine most of you are tuning in because you want to learn about some of the iconic individuals and places that are part of our shared University of Minnesota history, as well as discover the rare and unique documents few get to see. Well, you've come to the right place. We'll be hearing from the University of Minnesota Archives today, the Institutional Memory and Official Records Repository of our university. Um, there's going to be an overview from uh, our university archivist, followed by some fun interactive quizzes and lots of great photos from uh, U of M history. So definitely stay tuned. Uh, today's webinar is part of a free series being offered by the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. We're having conversations with experts about career, life, and learning topics, and we're running monthly webinars from now until May. And uh, this webinar will be recorded and viewable afterwards at uh, minnesotaalumni.org webinars. And if you're on Twitter right now, feel free to tweet at us with the hashtag UMNWebinar or follow our UMN alumni account or our friends over at the libraries at UMNLIB. And um, yeah, let's have a, a conversation on Twitter if you are uh, so feel it today. Um, and as I mentioned, we have some upcoming webinars on uh, March 17th, get the most out of your insurance, and April 7th, negotiating your starting salary. Again, minnesotaalumni.org slash webinars. Uh, before we get started, I uh, just need to go over a few quick items on how to participate in today's event. If you have joined the presentation listening, your, listening using your computer speaker system, um, that's, you've been Sorry, let's start that one over again. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to listen over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane of the GoToWebinar panel and dial-in information will be displayed. If you experience audio difficulties while listening via your computer speakers, this can be caused by having multiple software applications open uh, which can eat up your computer's bandwidth. Also, if you're on wireless, uh, the audio signal may not be as strong, so perhaps move over to a hardwired internet connection. And uh, questions are welcome uh, during today's webinar, and you can submit them anytime uh, via the questions pane on your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, we'll be monitoring them along the way, so please uh, submit your questions uh, for the archives. And uh, this is going to be a fun conversation, and we do want to hear from you. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's webinar speaker, Eric Moore, the University Archivist for the University of Minnesota Archives. He leads the archival operations of the university's official collecting repository. Moore is also co-director of the University Digital Conservancy, the University of Minnesota's institutional repository of scholarly works, research data, in institutional digital records. He has advanced degrees in library and information sciences and historical studies. And he has been an absolute pleasure to work with uh, to help plan this webinar. And I'm very grateful for the time he's taking to join us today. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, John. Happy to be here. Awesome. Well, I'm going to switch over uh, presenter control to you. And uh, once you're up, you can take it away. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to Uncovering the Treasures of the University of Minnesota Archives. Uh, as John said, I'm Eric Moore, the University Archivist for the University of Minnesota. And as a quick overview, I'd like uh, to talk to you a little bit about the University Archives today and our mission and how we assist others in locating information that they need. Uh, we'll also have some uh, fun today uh, with some pop quizzes along the way uh, because this is school after all and where you will learn more about some of the people, places, and events that are part of our university history. And finally, I'll end with a, a run through of some of the places online where you can do some of your own research into university history, family history, and more uh, related to the University of Minnesota. And as we go through the presentation today, 
uh, please feel free to post questions along the way. Uh, where I can, I'll try to answer things on the spot, but uh, we should also have plenty of time at the end of the presentation to do some question and answers. Uh, so we'll, we'll uh, think of your questions along the way and let me know uh, at that point. The University of Minnesota Archives were established in 1928 at the request of then former president William Watts Falwell. And we are one of the oldest university archives in the Big Ten. We are located on the West Bank in Elmer L. Anderson Library and are open to the public five days a week, Monday through Friday. And the university archives are a unit of the University of Minnesota Libraries. We have a mandate by the Board of Regents based on four principles. The first is that we shall collect and preserve the historically valuable documentation of the university, its units, its individuals, including faculty, staff, and administrators. And this can include all types of material, administrative documents, data sets, photographs, film, publications, maps, and even websites. We provide broad access to information resources in published and unpublished forms. We provide preservation of information resources in all formats and media. And we are accessible to all members of the university community and to the broader state and global communities. We support university functions and scholarly research. We provide verifiable, accurate information uh, by using official documents and providing historical context to our users. Over half of the users for the University Archives are University of Minnesota faculty, staff, and students. The U Archives recorded 2,400 reference questions in person, by phone, and by email in 2015. That amounts to an average of one new question every 50 minutes that we're open. And each of those questions takes us about 30 minutes to answer. We provide these reference services to scholars, to students, to genealogists and family historians, and alumni, both here in the Twin Cities and from around the world. Popular requests are for photographs of campus, of individuals, athletics, yearbooks, and commencement programs. We offer long-term solutions to the preservation of valuable materials. Now this image is not of the University of Minnesota Archives, but rather a storage facility that had important records stored within it. And part of our job is to visit places just like this that have historically valuable materials, and whether they're stored in attics, or basements, garages, on campus, or in people's homes. And we bring back what we find to the university and uh, care for it in our state-of-the-art caverns built underground in the university's campus on the West Bank in Elmer and L. Anderson Library. One of our major focuses is digitization. We are attempting to close the gap between discovery of archival materials and the delivery to them. And we put the archival information that we digitize in the flow of your own research activities. In many cases, that means digitizing the material and getting them online in such a way that you will discover it simply through using Google. To date, We've digitized over 1.5 million pages of documents, publications, reports, and other paper-based material. We've scanned over 20,000 photographs and maps depicting university history, activities, people, and places. And this year, we are beginning a really exciting project to begin digitizing over 2,000 audio tapes, especially those materials that were related to KUOM, the university's radio station, and broadcasts that they recorded. 
but we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. The University Digital Conservancy is the university library's response to a growing course of need on campus for a secure, central, and stable digital repository to hold institutional content and scholarly works in an open and freely accessible format. It is also home for born digital content produced and published by the university, faculty, and students that would have traditionally come to the university archives in paper format. Examples include Regents Minutes, dockets, theses and dissertations, newsletters, reports, and more. And part of the work we're doing with our digitization is to incorporate these materials with the born digital materials we're collecting today, providing full runs of access to departmental newsletters or Regents Minutes that uh, allow you to search across uh, from the 1800s to today. And in this way, the Digital Conservancy is serving as a digital arm for the work of the University Archives. There are nearly 50,000 individual records and hundreds of new items added every month. And from our work with digital repositories, our commitment is expanding to include the electronic archives of the university, uh, both records of value as well as the university's web presence. The web is, after all, a great informational resource, and we're finding it worthy of preservation. In 2015, we captured 2.2 million web files just for the University of Minnesota. And this year, we'll mark our 20th years worth of website history for the university uh, that we have available for access through the university archives. Oh, it's time for your first pop quiz. So we're going to take this one way back for our quiz number one. What year was the first commencement? 1855, 1862, 1869, 1873. I'll give you a few seconds here to answer, about 10 to 15 seconds, and then we'll take a look at the uh, response rate, and uh, we'll go on from there and talk a little bit about the first commencement. All right, we've got our response here. So the answer is 1873. Oh, I don't see what the percentages are here, but it uh, looks like... Uh, um, most people assumed uh, it would have happened a little bit earlier. Yeah, uh, so uh, about 8% said 1873. Oh. So those 8%, yep. you are very, very smart. <laughs> That's right. Okay, I've, I see them now. So, um, okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about these dates and why it is 1873. So uh, as many of you probably guessed uh, or know that the university was founded in 1855, or sorry, 1851, and uh, the assumption would be that we would graduate four years later. Uh, but actually, uh, the university uh, did not start teaching collegiate level courses until 1869. Uh, prior to that, the university was uh, uh, first started as a preparatory school, uh, but was largely closed between the years uh, 1857 and uh, 1869. Uh, and so, uh, we uh, see in um, 1869 uh, a reorganization of the university uh, and as part of that uh, they designed the first collegiate coursework uh, and pathways to graduation uh, and so we see uh, here in this document uh, from a 1869 uh, a report to the regents uh, that pathway uh, and the major majors that were offered at the time are in agriculture medicine science, literature, and arts, or the precursor to today's CLA, uh, and law. Now, uh, that first class of 1873 consisted of two graduates. Uh, their names were Henry Martin Williamson and Warren Clark Eustace. Uh, and many people often ask us when the first woman was to graduate from the university, uh, uh, believing that the university was actually for men only, but that's not true. Uh, in 1875, the first woman graduate, Helen Mar Ely, uh, and also the first international student, 
Andrew Cass, uh, from Canada, but still international, uh, received degrees. Uh, Andrew Franklin Heiler is uh, identified as the first African-American student to graduate from the university, uh, and that's in 1882. Uh, Scotty Primus Davis is thought to be the first African-American woman to graduate uh, in 1904. All right, so we're going to go on to question number two. Who was not a University of Minnesota president? Guy Stanton Ford, Marion Burton, or John Sargent Pillsbury, George Vincent? And I'll give you a moment to answer there. And I see some of you are having a hard time with my, uh, so I'll be sure to speak up. All right, we have answers coming in. And the answer, uh, John Sargent Pillsbury was not a University of Minnesota president. So it looks like 30% of you got that correct. Uh, uh, you, uh, uh, the other three all, of course, were University of Minnesota presidents, uh, although many of them had fairly short tenures. Uh, but we generally see their names around campus today. So John Sargent Pillsbury uh, is best known as founder of Pillsbury Milling Company and as a former governor of Minnesota from 1876 to 1882. But he served as a regent from 1863 to 1895 and was then appointed regent for life by the state legislature. He's often referred to as the father of the university due to his work to help administrator the selling of federal lands granted to the university in order to pay off its debts and creditors when it first uh, opened. Of course, William, Fall, William Watts Falwell was our first president, serving from 1869 to 1884. In 1887, uh, a report on his performance, uh, John Sargent Pillsbury refers to him as the master of the situation. And he certainly was a jack of all trades. In addition to serving as university president, Falwell also served as a faculty member in political science, economics, and as the first university librarian. His personal papers at the university archives include correspondence, lecture notes, as well as admonishments to students he believed had acted poorly in class, uh, as well as a draft of the first University of Minnesota diploma, uh, handwritten by Falwell. Uh, it's in Latin, so uh, you might have to practice a little to read it. Of the other choices I presented, George Edgar Vincent was president from 1911 to 1917. Under his term, the General Extension Division was established, uh, as well as the University Senate. Marion Burton served from 1917 to 1912. During his time, much of the groundwork began for the planning and financing of what would become Northrop Mall. However, Burton left Minnesota before its establishment to become president of the University of Michigan. And Guy Stanton Ford served only from 1938 to 1941. However, he's best known for serving as the longtime running dean of the graduate school before becoming president. During his tenure, Kaufman Memorial Union opened in 1940. Okay, let's try another question. What is the oldest building on campus? Eddy Hall, Hillsbury Hall, the Armory, Falwell Hall. They're all pretty close to each other on campus, so you get kind of a general idea of where the campus first started. All right, answer? Yes, Eddie Hall uh, is the correct answer. Uh, originally known as the Mechanic Arts Building, uh, Eddie Hall uh, was built in 1886, uh, but it's actually the fourth major building built for the university, but the only one that survives today. The other three buildings were known as the main building, or what's often referred to as Old Main, built in 1856 uh, and burned in 1904. 
Uh, it sat approximately on the site of Shevlin Hall today. The Agricultural College Building was built in 1875 and also burned in 1888, and it sat at the site of today's Nicholson Hall. So uh, the Agricultural School was on the Minneapolis campus. And finally, the Coliseum, a little-known building in University of Minnesota history, built in 1884 and burned to the ground in 1894. And as you can see, it essentially was built out of matchsticks. Uh, it sat at today's site of Sanford Hall on University Avenue. And the Coliseum served as the university's gathering place, uh, as well as a location for um, uh, military tactics and drills. And here on this campus map that depicts what the campus looked like in 1885, you can see in the upper left-hand corner the Coliseum there on University Avenue. And going down to the lower right, you can see a, a building that looks kind of like an H on its side. And that's the old main or main campus building. Uh, next to it is a spot where Eddie Hall will be built the following year. And then, of course, the agricultural building, uh, which sits uh, approximately where Nicholson sits today. Of the other choices I presented to you, there was Pillsbury Hall, which was built in 1889. And I love this picture because uh, one of the things you notice in these older photos is not much attention was given to um, uh, uh, plantings and other type of uh, uh, landscape design at the university in the early days. The armory was built in 1896, and this essentially replaced the function of the Colosseum. And finally, Falwell Hall opened in 1907. And this is a nice picture, too, as we can see uh, uh, perhaps some students walking along Pleasant Street and a horse-drawn carriage uh, kind of blurred at the bottom of the photograph. Uh, all right, very good. All right, who's ready for the next question? Let's go to question number four, which is, what was the name given to the football field prior to the construction of Memorial Stadium in 1924? Was it Falwell Field, Northrop Field, St. Anthony Field, or University Stadium? Give you a few minutes to think about your sports history for the University of Minnesota uh, and answer the questions. And we'll see what the poll results show. So uh, the answer uh, is Northrop Field, and you are correct. Uh, Northrop Field um, was the on-campus stadium at the University of Minnesota for the football team beginning in 1899 through 1923. And it was named for then university president Cyrus Northrop, who served at the university from 1884 to 1911, uh, almost 30 years of a tenure at the university. Uh, the uh, game depicted here, uh, I believe, is a 1904 game against Wisconsin. Uh, and there's so many fun things to love about this picture. If you look at it kind of closely, you can see that the field essentially sits where Memorial Stadium uh, would later be built. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you can see the turret for the armory. You can see some people perched up there getting a bird's eye view of the game. Uh, but more fun than that are the people who've climbed up the electricity poles uh, and are way up there at the top. Uh, and you can see them uh, spying in on the game as itself. But if you are able to uh, peer uh, close to your computer screen, you can even say, see that the players are in motion on the field. Uh, and so it's uh, uh, right at the height of the game. And I have to confess, I don't know who won. Uh, so don't ask me. Uh, but I, I meant to look. But I tell you what, if you, if you want to know, uh, that's something we can, we can pretty easily look up at the university archives. Of course, most people are more familiar with Memorial Stadium, which opened up in 1924 and served as the home for Gopher football until the team moved to the Metrodome in 1982. But the stadium remained standing for another 10 years to 1992 before it was torn down. 
uh, and from time to time it was made of use. Uh, here we see members of the band uh, taking the stands, uh, but nobody on the field, of course. Uh, and uh, perhaps you can read the button the band, the tuba players holding up, it reads, Save Memorial Stadium, which was a, um, an effort in the late 80s to try to retain the stadium on campus. All right. So let's move on to uh, question number five. All right. So in what decade did the University of Minnesota make groundbreaking advancements in open heart surgery? The 1920s, 40s, 50s, or 70s? I'll give you a moment to think about that. Think about your medical history here at the University of Minnesota. And uh, then we'll take a look here at the answers once a few more come in. 1950s, very good. Most of you know that the University of Minnesota made most of its advancements in the 1950s, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, what that actually meant. So by the late 1940s, awareness of heart disease began to rise among the different, uh, uh, about different methods for heart surgery, uh, and they were actively being tested here at the University of Minnesota through the Department of Surgery. However, it wasn't until September of 1952 that F. John Lewis and his team, consisting of Mansur Taufik, Richard Varko, and C. Walt Lillehei, successfully repaired a heart defect inside the heart by using hyperthermia as a means to limit the need for freshly oxygenated blood long enough to repair the defect inside approximately six minutes. Here, we see doctors Varco and Lewis pictured with the cooling blanket used to induce the hyperthermia in the 1952 operation. In March of 1954, Dr. Lillehei famously advanced the technique when he, along with Morley Cohen and Herb Orden, developed a means to remove blood flow to the heart but keep the blood freshly infused with oxygen. This procedure was known as cross-circulation, and here we see Dr. Lillehei in front of an exhibit demonstrating cross-circulation open-heart surgery. The process required a living donor to connect their circulatory system to the patient and essentially pump their blood for them while they, or the patient's heart was open. By 1956, Doctors using Richard DeWall's bubble oxygenator, pictured here, were able to control the process with a machine, uh, which replaced the need for a living donor to help infuse the blood supply with fresh oxygen. Okay, so that was an easy one apparently for many of you. So we're gonna we're gonna try something. Uh, with this next question to see how many of you get this one. This is, this is one of my favorites. Between 1917 and 1924, the university displayed two live animals in captivity on campus. What kind of animals were on display? Gophers, beavers, bears, or wolves? I'll give you a moment to think a little bit about who would best represent uh, li live animals on campus. Okay, let's see what the answer is. All right, we have 29% said gophers, 23 said beavers, 15 bears, and 33 wolves. So fairly even split here among some of the responses. You might be surprised to learn the answer is beavers. Okay. So Carlos Avery who is Game and Fish Commissioner for the state of Minnesota, presented the two beavers to Thomas Sadler Roberts, then director of the Minis Museum of Natural History, or what we know today as the Bell Museum. The animals lived in a pond behind the animal biology, or later called zoology building, which was demolished in 1994. Some of you may remember that building. It sat approximately where Passamole Hall sits today. The beavers were named Horatio and Ignatius. 
and they enjoyed some publicity over the years uh, during their time on campus and were a very popular attraction, both for the public and students. Unfortunately, one beaver escaped in 1920 and the other died in 1924. The story of the beavers are just a small portion of our archival collections documenting the history of the Bell Museum and natural history research at the University of Minnesota. In March of 1872, the Minnesota legislature had enacted a bill establishing what, is, what was known as the Minnesota Geological Natural History Survey under the auspices of the Board of Regents of the University of Minnesota to carry on a thorough geological and natural history survey of the state. The survey was overseen by Newton Horace Winchell, also established academic coursework at in the fields of geology, botany, and zoology, and initiated the creation of a museum of natural history. In 19, or sorry, in uh, 2014, the University Archives completed a project to digitize nearly 200,000 pages of material related to the history of the natural uh, natural history survey, as well as the Bell Museum. Uh, and this consisted of correspondence, field notebooks, and other paper materials. We also digitized nearly 15,000 photographs depicting botanical images, birds, fauna, and the landscape of Minnesota. And all of those materials are available online. So I'm going to show you just a very few small set of samples. Um, here are a picture of Iris Bear's color, um, better known as Blue Flag, uh, from 1902 near Grand Marais. Here's a chickadee and a youngling uh, near Reno, Minnesota in Houston County uh, from 1898. Here's a young moose, 1925 in Lake County. And one of my favorite photos the first fall of the Temperance River near Tofty in 1902. And uh, if you lean in close, you can see the individual sitting on the edge of the falls. So these photographs, uh, again, are all available online, and uh, both through the university uh, as well as through the university's partnership with the Digital Public Library of America. And uh, one of the uh, best ways to kind of browse some of these images is uh, most of them are geolocated. And so through the Digital Public Library of America, you can actually uh, search for the images by seeing what's available on a map of the state of Minnesota. And so you can find the images that are closest to the places that you live, at the places you like to visit, and be able to uh, uh, go back in history a little bit. All right, we're going to move on to our next question. And I'll click through there. So when was the last year the Gopher Yearbook was published? 2001, 1988, 1967, or it's still published today? What are your thoughts? How many of you received a Gopher Yearbook? Get some answers here. What do you say? Okay, the answer is coming in. 24% say 2001, 88, 1967, and another 24% say it's still published today. Well, for those of you who said 1967, you are correct. Uh, that was the last year the uh, Minnesota Gopher Annual Yearbook was published. Uh, for 80 years, the University of Minnesota's junior class published an annual yearbook simply titled The Gopher. Uh, the students uh, published the volume and uh, the tradition of the annual yearbook continued until 1967. Ongoing struggles, however, with printing and sales and finances led to the last gopher being published in this year. There are subsequent yearbook-like publications in the late 70s and early 80s, but none compare 
or are part of the original run of the gopher. Each gopher yearbook had a unique style and flourish of its own. These are just uh, two images from uh, thousands of pages uh, that show artistry and uh, depict kind of a, a, a sense of life on campus at the University of Minnesota. I believe that the image on the left of the flowers uh, comes from the 1898 gopher and the uh, image on the right uh, is from the uh, uh, 1920s. Uh, but uh, you can browse the gophers online and we'll talk about that in a few minutes about how to find them online and search for your grandparents, maybe your parents, or maybe even yourself uh, in the pages of the gopher. Okay, we're moving right along. Uh, we're going to ha uh, have one last question here and then I'll talk about some of our resources. In what year was the University of Minnesota's radio station established? 1912, 1922, 1938, or 1945? I'll give you a few moments to answer. I'll give you a hint. The radio station that was established, it's called Letters. You, many of you will know as KUOM. So think a little bit about your time on campus listening to the radio. See what the answers are. 40%, 41% say 1922. Uh, another 25, 38, 20, 45, and 14 say 1912. Well, the, the answer for establishment is uh, 1922. On January 13th, 1922, the university was granted a full license to broadcast under the call letters WLB. Today, WLB, later named KUOM in 1905, is best known as Radio K. These, uh, which broadcast from the Rarick Center on the West Bank on the Twin Cities campus. This makes KUOM the oldest continually operating broadcast station in the state of Minnesota and the oldest non-commercial educational station in the United States. It's pretty fantastic. KUOM was also part of a network of stations that created the foundation for NPR. Uh, and hosted, was the original host for NPR's show, All Things Considered. KUM through the years has produced educational programming that was recorded and broadcast and distributed throughout the country. The university, however, began experimenting with wireless telegraphy, or radio, in 1912 in the Electrical Engineering Department. However, uh, the station uh, was formalized as a professional station in 1922, and by 1938, it began a program called Minnesota School of the Air, which would run for nearly well, would run for 40 years, broadcasting weekly programming for elementary students and secondary students across the state. Uh, here we can see some of the performers uh, uh, producing the content. The studios for KUOM were in the basement of Eddie Hall, which we've already discussed, from uh, 1939 until 1974 when they moved to the Rarick Center. And in 1993, KUOM merged with the then student-operated WMMR, which broadcasted from the basement of Kaufman Union, to form Radio K, the station we know today. And I had mentioned earlier in my talk about the digitization of audio uh, tapes from KUM, and, uh, and this is all part of one larger project to help to not only provide access to the audio tapes uh, for people to use and listen and enjoy, but also to provide long-term preservation because magnetic tape, which is what holds most of the broadcast radio, um, is a type of format that is nearing its end of life. Uh, uh, it began in the 1940s, shortly after World War II, and uh, the university uh, has nearly 80 or 8,000 uh, audio tapes uh, in the university archives, 
And so we're going to try to get at least a quarter of those done in the next year uh, and able uh, that those can be preserved uh, far into the future. Well, uh, those are the end of my uh, quiz questions for everybody. I'd uh, be curious if anybody would like to self-report, uh, if they uh, got all of those correct. Uh, I, I don't have any door prizes for you here on the webinar today, but uh, <laughs> uh, it would be fun to, to see what uh, you're up to. Yeah. Well, I see from the question stream that one of uh, uh, somebody did look up the 1904 score and Minnesota okay. beat Wisconsin by the score of 28 to nothing. So it was a victory. Wow, it was a blowout. What a yeah. fun game. No matter the, no wonder those people were, were up in the, the, the polls watch, watching. So, mm -hmm. Sierra, so I've got a few more questions here. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our research uh, and our resources that are available to you. And then uh, uh, we can open it up to a few more questions as well. So uh, first of all, if you would like to find any of the materials that I've shown you today, any of the photographs or the documents or uh, uh, some information about these history projects, uh, the best place for you to start is at the University of Minnesota Archives webpage. And uh, don't worry, uh, at the in a few slides, I will give you the URLs to all the pages I talk about. Uh, so uh, you can either uh, write them down from there or come back to the recording of this webinar uh, and use those as a way to jump off and, and do some of your own research. Uh, but mostly I'd like to start here and show that uh, this is where you search for information about uh, our university records and the personal papers of faculty and administrators. Uh, this is also an opportunity for you, you can see in the middle, a search box uh, and some tabs there to search for our images uh, and to search the Digital Conservancy, um, as well as uh, uh, other sources that are available. We have uh, um, links to our history projects and, um, and ways to contact us on this page. Start here and you can get just about anywhere with the University of Minnesota History. Uh, we talked about the Digital Conservancy earlier uh, in, this, in this webinar, but I would just again like to highlight that this is uh, an, a fantastic resource in terms of trying to understand university history, especially if you're wanting to understand things kind of um, as they change at the university. Uh, I had mentioned that we, we take in you know, digital documents today, the minutes and commencement programs and, and other uh, materials published by the university, and we've paired those with the digitized versions of the, of the material held in the archives. Uh, and so the ability to search for the first commencement program, or you know, what were the first course books uh, available uh, for students to use to determine the classes that they would take, uh, or maybe you yourself took classes here in the 1970s or the 1980s and need access to course descriptions uh, to uh, you know show an employer or some type of certification that you've had this information. Uh, all of that is available to you. Uh, through uh, just a few uh, clicks and keyword searches uh, in the Digital Conservancy. But it does more than that. It's also the home to our, our theses and dissertations on campus. It's, uh, it's a new home for uh, University of Minnesota generated data, whether that's through um, grant funded data or university created data. Uh, and all the material that's in the Digital Conservancy is open access and it's free to use and uh, you don't have to sign in or be on campus to use it uh, and and most of the content that's in here is is also easily discoverable uh, just through a regular Google search. I really wish I could show you this uh, this application live but uh, live demos and webinars are always kind of bad ideas but uh, I want to talk to you about this campus history page uh, and, and, and let you know if you're interested in at all in campus history, building planning, um, or just, just uh, uh, have a curiosity for how things have changed over the years, this is a go-to place. Uh, so um, our good friends in Wilson Library and the Portrait Map Library uh, uh, put most of the effort into this and uh, uh, used some resources from the University Archives to create this wonderful application. 
And uh, if, if you're familiar with mapping software, mapping applications, some of this will, will seem, uh, uh, will be evident to you. But uh, what we start with here is essentially a map of the university campus as it exists today. And over top of that, we can layer historical maps. The one that's displayed here, the blue map laid over the, the street view, is a, a map of the East Bank campus from 1898. And we can see some of the buildings I pointed out earlier. The old main building is still there. Uh, Pillsbury Hall is there now. Uh, Nicholson Hall is now sitting where the, the egg building had been. Uh, and of course, Eddie Hall is there too. The next layer we see are those, those yellow footprints of the historic buildings that were all geocoded into this uh, application. And then a layer on top of that, you can see the bubble that is popped out from uh, um, the armory on the right-hand side. Uh, and uh, by clicking on each of these building footprints, you'll get an information about the age of the building, uh, the various names that building has had over time, maybe. Uh, uh, and then a link to photographs, all the photographs that we've digitized and have available online um, uh, depicting these buildings. And right now we have well over, I think, 6,000 building photographs uh, depicting campus throughout history available to you through this application. Uh, and then at the very bottom, you'll see a timeline uh, going from 1860 to present. And you can scroll through that timeline uh, to any date and as you do so, you'll see the building footprints appear and disappear on campus and the different maps and the campus take form. Uh, and it's a fantastic way to really understand how the university has grown over the years. So I highly encourage you to come uh, and visit the campus history map. Some of our project sites related to some of our quiz questions today. So uh, we have a project here called Memorial Stadium. Uh, and this is a fun project. This is an online display uh, exhibit of not only the, the building itself and football uh, and the games played within this stadium, but also the pageantry uh, and research that was actually conducted on campus in the stadium itself. Uh, and so you can really get a sense of, of why the stadium was so important and how it was so interconnected with campus life and uh, the campus environment. We have a fairly new uh, project page here about the uh, online exhibit about the history of open heart surgery at the University of Minnesota, uh, uh, beginning with uh, the early research done in the, in the 1940s, um, all the way through uh, the, the use of, of uh, and development of the pacemaker uh, uh, with uh, uh, the role of Earl Bakken and Seawalt Lillehei uh, in that process. Uh, so. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, online resource. Uh, we know it's, it's pretty popular with History Day students and some of the undergraduate courses that are doing um, history of medicine and history of science at the University of Minnesota. And the Go for Yearbooks. As I mentioned, uh, there will be a link here and a few more slides that will give you an opportunity to go right to the site and you can browse through them by each year. Uh, as you open each volume, there should be a little search box on the inside and you can type in names and search across the pages. Uh, and, uh, and so if you, you think you know when somebody graduated or you want to look somebody up, uh, uh, this hopefully uh, will be a great resource for you. And, uh, um, and, and uh, even if you don't know of anybody who might be in the yearbooks, they're just fantastic for their artwork and their design. And we have some other uh, uh, project sites. Uh, this one uh, is representing our Exploring Minnesota's Natural History, the, the digitization project I spoke about with the, the Natural History Survey and the Bell Museum. Uh, uh, just some fantastic stories about the photographers and the, the, the researchers and the people who went out in the field uh, and made the systematic uh, uh, um, uh, data collection of of uh, Minnesota's environment um, and its fauna and its birds and uh, and and plant life, uh, so it's a it's a great site to uh, take a look at. So um, the most important thing, though, uh, uh, for you to do, if uh, you have any questions for us, 
uh, is to, of course, you are always welcome to take a look at some of these websites, um, our, our main site, the Digital Conservancy site, the MAP site, as I mentioned before, um, or to look at the, the project sites that are here. And again, I know I'm going quickly, but you can uh, come, come back and look at the recording to get the web addresses you're interested in. Um, is to, uh, but the most important thing to do is to feel free to contact us at any time at the University Archives uh, and let us know what you're interested in, what you'd like to research, uh, and we will be more than happy, or more than happy to help you uh, find what you need and to assist you in any way we can so that uh, you can take some time to find your own treasures within the University Archives. So I'd like to thank you uh, for tuning in today uh, and for taking part in uh, the pop quiz. And, uh, um, uh, and I was really impressed with the answers. Uh, uh, and I'm glad that uh, um, University of Minnesota history is important to you. Uh, it's important to me. So uh, with that, I think we have a few minutes here to uh, try to respond to a few of the questions that uh, have come through. Or if you have other questions that uh, um, you've thought of during the uh, time, uh, feel free to type those in now, and um, I'll see what I can do. I, I, uh, you may stump the archivist, but uh, I'm happy to uh, help. Let's see here. So we have a, uh, one question uh, that's highlighted here. How do you distinguish between junk, trash, and treasure? Right, so one person's treasure is another person's trash. Uh, that is certainly true. So uh, it's it's really part of a, a, an archival process called appraisal. And uh, when we look at materials, uh, institu institutional materials and uh, materials that we would like to bring into the archives, we, we do an appraisal process. And this isn't necessarily a monetary appraisal. Uh, in fact, often it's not. It's more about the, the uh, the value that we see in the records, whether they are original, uh, who created them, the amount of informational value they contain versus the, the secondary values that we see within these materials. So example, we see all of these photographs and maps and, um, and documents uh, and, and we can see their importance that yes, this is a photograph of the building and yes, this is a map of campus from 1898 uh, but, you know, if it's 1898, that doesn't seem very important to you at the time. But when we start collating these together, and, and as in the MAP history project, where then those were all brought together to build those rich layers of information, uh, that's what we look for for kind of secondary value for archival materials. And, uh, and that's how we distinguish the trash from the treasure. Let's see if we have another one here. Um, uh, let's see here. Do the archives? Uh, do you have archives for each college? Uh, so yes, the University of Minnesota Archives is the is the collecting repository for the University of Minnesota, uh, its uh, schools and colleges, its departments and faculty members. So uh, we have a range of materials all across the university and for all the different uh, colleges and departments, <coughs> um, from the medical school to the College of Ag to uh, college, liberal arts, IT, um, Carlson School, so on and so on. So uh, if you have particular interest in particular college history, uh, feel free to contact us and let us know. Do you know that the U was the first BSN program in the US? Um, you know what? Uh, I, I am not sure about that, but um, uh, I will uh, take your word for that, um, and actually, I'm going to take a look at that as well. That's a that's a curious fact. So thank you. Um, how does one become an archivist? Uh, good question. There are many ways, many paths to this profession. Uh, uh, typically, we see a lot of people uh, enter the profession through library schools. Uh, also, people who maybe have uh, advanced degrees in history or museum studies um, are, is another popular path. Uh, but, but mostly uh, uh, professional archivists uh, have a graduate degree in one of those main areas. Do you feel, do you welcome old pictures of the U we might have? You know, we're always happy to consider photographs. Uh, uh, we have a few things about photographs that we, we hopefully uh, uh, 
their label uh, or, or there's some information about the photograph that places it in some type of context. Um, we, uh, uh, in terms of alumni providing con uh, materials, content to the university archives, uh, one of the areas where we see uh, some really fantastic photographs uh, that provide that context um, are uh, old scrapbooks uh, from alumni. Uh, and so we generally try to you know, look at them individually and, and, uh, um, and we, we do ask that people give us the originals. Uh, we, we generally don't uh, do scanning and then give back, uh, but we're always happy to talk to you and, and take a look at materials you might have. Who do we submit info to about U of M faculty who contributed in large ways? Well, you know, if you are curious about uh, providing us information, um, we are uh, more than interested in talking to you. Um, you know, we work with faculty, we work with families, we work with um, uh, staff members and administrators all throughout the university uh, to really kind of identify uh, uh, major uh, individuals and important research uh, that's appropriate to have at the university archives. Uh, so again, uh, the default answer is always feel free to call or email. All right, and Sierra, do we have any other questions? Uh, do, uh, we're running close here on time. Do you have any records of third century, th three century graduate families? Oh, oh I see, uh, families from over three decades, maybe. Uh, for example, my grandfather was an 1898 grad. I received degrees in 1990, 99. My daughter is now a freshman. So, you know, uh, here again, uh, uh, your grandfather might be in the yearbook. Uh, uh, we might have commencement programs uh, that list your grandfather. We might have uh, commencement pro programs for your degrees in 1990, 1998. Uh, it's, it's always kind of a hit or miss uh, doing uh, student research, but sometimes we're really surprised at how much we can find about any one particular student at the University of Minnesota. All right, and um, Let's see here. I think there's a question here. Do you have any, uh, could you touch on archival information outside of the university um, other than Minnesota history? So, uh, yeah, so this is a, a good question. Uh, the University of Minnesota Archives is in um, the Elmer L. Anderson Library. Uh, we are one of about 14 different uh, archives and special collections within Anderson Library. And so uh, please take an opportunity to look at the University of Libraries website. Uh, if you have other interests, um, uh, it's possible we have an archival collection just for you. Uh, some of the other units we have are the Children's Literature Research Collections, the uh, Charles Babbage Institute and Archives, the Immigration History Research Center Archives, uh, the YMCA archives, uh, social welfare archives, and uh, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to miss some of the best ones, of course, uh, my colleagues will reprimand me afterwards, uh, performing arts archives, literary archives, uh, again, uh, uh, the, the, the Treader archives for GLBT studies, it's just, it's an amazing amount of material that's in Anderson Library, and again, uh, all of this is available for the public. Okay. Eric, thank so, you so much for uh your time today and your, your great insight on the history of the University of Minnesota, but then also what you and your staff uh, are doing uh, to really uh, pre preserve these uh, memories and records and make them accessible both for uh, the U of M community, but then for the, the greater state of Minnesota as well. Uh, well, thank you. I was really happy to be here today and thank you everybody for tuning in. Thank you so much. And uh, so that's the close of today's webinar. Um, just want to say um, thank you to all the University of Minnesota Alumni Association uh, members who make uh, new initiatives like this webinar series possible. Thank you so much. Because of members, we can enrich the lives of alumni, support student success, and make a better University of Minnesota. And if you're interested in becoming an Alumni Association member, uh, visit us at minnesotaalumni.org slash join. That's the conclusion of today's webinar. It was a great topic. Thank you again to Eric and the University of Minnesota Archives and Library Systems. Uh, I, just great resources there. And so if, if these things are of interest, definitely feel free uh, to check those out. And if even if you're near or far, if you're part of our 455,000 uh, alumni community worldwide, um, definitely stay connected. So have a wonderful day. And thank you for joining us.